I've been developing games for over 10 years, and the past 5 or so years have been with the Godot game engine. Today I want to talk about some of the things I wish I knew when I was getting started with the engine. So the first thing I want to mention is, at if any point you want to check the documentation on a topic, simply hit F1 on your keyboard, and this will bring up the search, so you can literally search for like anything in Godot. And then of course, if you click on the button right here, you can open the online documentation if you would like. The next tip I have is to not write code that's dependent on the layout of your scene tree or the state of your game. So it's really important to create objects that are able to run on their own. So for this example, I have a player and they essentially just have a health value. And what I'm doing is when their health changes, I want to update this UI element. And I don't want the player to be dependent on that UI element existing. So what I've done instead is I've created a signal that emits when the health is changed and then the UI can just directly connect to that signal and update whenever the player updates. So as a base note, just make sure that all of your scripts and nodes can run independently without needing to rely on anything else existing. Now this next tip is something I see a lot of people doing and it's extremely bad practice so I wanted to cover this in detail, but essentially it's to not use static paths or paths that are prone to breaking. So in my example I'm on the player node and inside of this script I want to get a reference to the world node, which is obviously a parent. Now the way you would typically do this is you can use the dot dot um, inside of a string path and this will get the parent so essentially I'm doing dot dot forward slash dot dot which gets the parent node and although this does work it's really not recommended because first of all I don't know what this node is with just the two dots I don't actually have a visual representation of what the node is called inside of my script view. So in that case, it makes it more difficult to edit as a developer. And on top of that, it's going to break really easily. So let's say I went into my scene and I was gonna change the order of things. Maybe I wanted to drag the player outside of the entities folder so that they could be on their own section, right? All of a sudden I would need to update my code and I might not even notice that this is a problem until it starts throwing bugs at me, which is really irritating. So generally it's better to avoid using static paths like this. And instead what I like to do is maybe turn this into an export variable and then instead only set the type of the property. And now if I click on the player, I can just assign this property to the world node and then even if I change the name of world or move the player around, I can be assured that this world reference is never going to break. Now more on the topic of debugging your code, typically you'll use a lot of print statements when debugging and those can be really helpful but sometimes you want to pause code until a specific thing happens and you can do this with breakpoints. So if you're new to coding or game development in general, a breakpoint is what you create by going to the left of a line right here and you can essentially just click on this red dot and it's going to stop your code at this specific line. So what I'm gonna do is add a breakpoint right here. And then when I run my project, if I input an event, it's going to basically pause my game and give me a full breakdown on the current state of the project. So let me hit that input and you can see that I got an error. Well, it's actually just a breakpoint, but it gives me a full rundown on exactly where it happened and some really helpful information on exactly what's going on with this node and the project in general. Now, if everything looks good from here, I'm able to go to this little icon right here and just continue the code. So by clicking this, everything is gonna continue to run normally. And you can obviously see how that would be really useful for debugging. So next up is to use version control. So if you don't know what version control is, I would highly recommend looking into Git. That's G-I-T, and there should be a link to that in the description. And then I also have a card, which will be in the top right right now, but that'll link you to a video series which I've created that will get you started with using Git and version control. But essentially what that will be is saving the state of your game so you're able to make commits and then save all your files at a specific version. And that way, if you break your code or if you lose files on your computer, you're able to roll back to previously committed versions and save all of your work, which is essential for game development. Like if you don't have this setup, go do that right now because you really want this and it's extremely helpful. So my next tip and something that you probably noticed about my script right here is going to be static typing. So I'm gonna make a new script to kind of show that off. 
So static typing essentially refers to telling Godot what the type of a variable or a return is going to be. So typically if I was to, let's say, make a health variable, I would want to set it equal to something like 100 when the game starts. Now let's say inside of my ready function, I for some reason forgot what health was supposed to be. So maybe I didn't get a lot of sleep last night and I just set health to like uh, my name or something like that. By default, Godot will not detect that this is an issue. And if you're coming from other languages, this is something that you typically don't want to do or can't even do. But generally, we don't want a variable that has a type of int to be able to get assigned to a string. So maybe we don't notice this issue, we run the game, and then we notice that we get an error or something, and realistically you're gonna find it and you're gonna fix it, but what if we want that to show up inside of the editor before we actually go through the trouble of running the game? Well, that's when static typing comes in handy. So by adding a colon at the end of my variable name, and then simply typing int, which stands for integer, and that is the type of this variable, Godot is now gonna throw an error right inside of my editor saying that, hey, this health is a type of integer, so you can't assign a string to it. And this is super helpful because now I know like, oh, I'm I'm just being stupid and this should actually be like uh, 50. I don't know why you would do that in a real scenario. But for the example, if you get the picture, it's really useful to statically type because it basically helps you read your code more easily, helps you catch errors before they actually happen. And then for things like functions, it really helps with return types so that you know exactly what you're gonna be getting back from a function call. Now, if you wanna statically type a function, like this is even function I've created right here, you would simply go right before the colon at the end of the line and you type a dash and then a greater than symbol and then you would simply type the name of the return type. So in this case, we are returning a Boolean, whether or not the number that we've provided is even. So I would say bool, and this way Godot knows that this function returns a Boolean. Now this is especially helpful for standalone functions. So in this case, I've converted my method to print is even. So it's not gonna return anything, but it will instead just print directly to the output. So we've assigned the return type to void and Godot is gonna catch onto this and throw an error right here because we're trying to set the return of this function into a variable. And since it doesn't return anything, Godot will catch onto that and we'll get that nice error. So the main takeaway, just use static typing, makes your life easier, makes Godot run super slightly faster, and also makes your code more readable. The next topic is gonna have to do with add-ons. So typically when you're making a game, you want to develop different tools that will assist in the development process. So whether that's generating normal maps for textures or creating entire NPC dialogue trees, you're gonna wanna have these systems in place so that they speed up your development time. And what I really wanna focus on here is that you do not have to make these tools on your own. Now, obviously it's fun to make tools on your own and you know have that experience under your belt, but the reality is if you want to make a plugin for Godot, chances are somebody's already done it. So it's really useful to go to the asset library tab right here and from here you can search on all the existing plugins for Godot and there's a lot of really useful stuff there. So I would definitely recommend checking that out. Now some of the best plugins that I personally use are obviously Dialogic, which is the most popular dialogue management system that'll help with creating like timelines, dialogue trees, characters, and all that fancy stuff. And then Panku Console is another really great one that will essentially run inside of your project while you are playing the game. And this will allow you to track different variables, the state of your game, and also run commands directly from a built-in command line. So it's really useful for the debugging process and also play testing. And then another really helpful one is gonna be Godot Steam, which is basically an application that seamlessly connects Godot to Steam. So if you plan on releasing your game on Steam or doing any sort of multiplayer through Steam or even just creating achievements or whatever, then this plugin is going to be essential to your development. So again, it's really good to look into all the existing Godot plugins in case there are any that could speed up your development process. So the next tip is that you wanna make everything into a scene. Now, when I got started using Godot, I was really like careful about how many scenes I have 
but realistically it's better to have more scenes because in game development you want to recycle as much as possible. So you might be looking at my scene tree right here and this player isn't its own scene. So by right clicking it and clicking on save branch as scene, I'm just gonna chuck it in this folder here. This will make it its own file so I can now open this up and any changes I make to the player scene are going to be reflected in every instance of the player scene. So if I go back to my world, I can hit Control D to duplicate the player. And now since these two players are inheriting from the same scene, any changes I make inside of this scene will be reflected for every instance. Now something that you're gonna run into a lot in Godot and is really irritating when it happens and you don't notice it is when you duplicate a node, it's going to share the same resources as the node that you duplicated it from. So in this case, I have an interact area. And as a child of this, I just have a collision shape. And on the collision shape, I've added a resource into its shape property. And this is gonna define the entire area that the shape influences. So if I click on the area and hit Control D, it's going to duplicate the area, but it will keep the reference to that same resource shape that I created earlier. So by changing the size of one of these shapes, it's going to change the size of both of them. And again, that's because both of these collision shape nodes are referencing the same circle shape resource. Now, obviously we don't want that in this case. So to fix it, all I do is right click on the resource and select make unique. And that will basically copy the resource so that I have a unique one for each of my nodes. The next tip is going to be to learn about signals. Now, signals are like one of the main ways that Godot functions between all of its nodes, and it's really good to understand exactly how they work. So I'm not gonna go too much in depth here, but I do have a video that should be in a card right in the top right somewhere, and that will basically go over all the essentials, everything you need to know about signals, but I would highly recommend looking into that sort of workflow, especially if you're getting started with Godot. And then the last tip is going to be to write code like somebody is gonna be reading it. Now, this is gonna be important for everybody out there, whether you're getting started with coding or you've been doing game development for a while, you always want to comment your code and you always want stuff to be organized because you're gonna come back to your code in like a couple months or a year and you might not know what the heck is going on. Like it might make sense to you today, but like fast forward even a week and stuff can look like ancient hieroglyphics. So it's really good to add comments to all of your functions all of your, your variables and even put them in line like this just to explain exactly what you're doing. But anyway, that's gonna do it for this video. So if you did enjoy or you learned something new, be sure to like and subscribe. And if you guys wanna see more videos like this or you wanna share any additional information that could help new Godot users out, be sure to place that in the comments below. And then if you wanna get connected, you can join the Discord, which is in the description and there's some other links there. But thanks again for watching. I hope you have a great week and I will see you in the next video.